Hi, I am a scientist, and I am most definitely not able to prove that the Earth is spherical. The reason for this is that in my work, I follow the scientific method, and science simply does not concern itself with proving things. So even though I say that I cannot prove that the Earth is spherical, I can do something else. I can disprove that the Earth is any other geometry that we can imagine. I can take Eratosthenes' measurements and extend it to a full-blown experiment. We take more than just two sticks and we place them along a line of longitude at different latitudes and then measure the solar declination at each position at the same time. Now, it doesn't matter if this sun is light years away, 150 million kilometers away, or just a short drive away. It doesn't matter if the Earth is flat, spherical, or any polyhedron. We can take each configuration and make some predictions and see how well the data actually fits the descriptions. And we then find that for each model there exists another model which gives a closer fit to the data until we reach the Earth being spherical with the Sun being quite far away. And suddenly we have found a model for which we cannot find a better one. Now this does not say that we have now definitely proven that the Earth is a sphere and that the Sun is quite far away, but it does mean that we have eliminated all the other possibilities that we can think of. Because proving something is not possible, scientists don't really concern themselves with being right, only with being less wrong. Take our understanding of the structure of an atom, for example. It is wrong to say that the atom is like a billiard ball and the smallest unit of matter. It is a little less wrong to say that the atom is a plum pudding of positive and negative charges wobbling about. To say that atoms have a positive core with electrons orbiting around it like planets in a solar system as is described by the Rutherford model, it is much better. But it is still wrong. An even better model is one that says that the orbits are quantized as in the Bohr model, but guess what? It is wrong. And then Pauli came along with this exclusion principle and using Heisenberg matrix mechanics he developed a quantum mechanical model of the atom which was then developed a bit by Schrodinger and lots of other clever people worked to provide us with a model which is scary accurate. But it probably is still wrong, or at least incomplete. Having said that, all of the above models are useful in certain situations. For example, in my video regarding the atmosphere and containers, I provide some semi-classical descriptions of the structure of an atom, which are patently wrong. In my video regarding the Curie temperature, I describe how an electron produces a magnetic field. Also completely wrong, but both were close enough that they were useful for the purposes. And this is an important point. Just because a model is wrong, it doesn't mean it's not useful. Newton's theory of universal gravitation is very much incomplete, but it just doesn't make sense to go full Einstein when you just want to figure out how long it will take for a bottle to hit the ground, especially as the two models show pretty much the same thing. In addition, general relativity is also incomplete, and that is already implicit in the theory itself. You can think of scientific theory as a map of the Earth, and we can start with this monstrosity. It is clearly wrong, but it does vaguely point out where the land masses are. We can study up a bit and refine this map. Now granted, it is still pretty terrible, but at least it's better. We study a bit more and find a map that could possibly have some use, but our boats are still getting lost and in some cases taking very long routes to get to their destination. So we create a better map, but it still isn't too good. Eventually, we do come up with this map, which is pretty accurate. Of course, there is a lot of detail which this image cannot resolve, so it still doesn't reveal the whole picture. Now, with each iteration of our map, our description of the landmass has got better. The same goes with science. Each successive discovery improves our description of reality and it gets more accurate. But even with our current description, which is pretty damn good, we are not capturing the whole picture in full detail. Because of these basic ideas in science, we don't do experiments to see if we are right. Experiments show us how likely it is that we are wrong.
Of course, scientists are humans and humans are silly, so we, we never really explicitly state that we are testing to see how wrong we are. We tend to say that we do our experiments to support our hypothesis, and in our minds that is really what we think we are doing most of the time, and this works pretty well. And this is because of assumptions which are intrinsic in the process of analyzing data. When we do our experiment, we don't really test our hypothesis until the analysis stage, but at this analysis stage we inevitably try and fit a model to our data and in this process we get some numbers back which tell us how bad the fit is and how likely it is that the hypothesis is wrong. Most famously we have the p-value and a p-value represents the probability that the null hypothesis is true. In news stories you may have heard of confidence levels of 5 sigma and this is a reference to the p-value and the higher our sigma is the smaller our p-value and the less likely it is that the null hypothesis is true. In the case of the Higgs boson when it was first confirmed a confidence level of 5 sigma was associated with the discovery. This means that there was a 1 in 3.5 million chance that the null hypothesis is true. That is to say that if the particle does not exist, then there is a 1 in 3.5 million chance that we would observe the result that we observed. Currently the confidence level is at 7 sigma, which means that the probability of the null hypothesis being correct is 1 in 776 billion. Although we don't always go into an experiment with the intention of proving ourselves wrong, it, the assumption that we are wrong is always implicit in a data analysis, and a failure to perform this analysis properly will result in your experiment being killed during peer review. But where would my channel be if I didn't throw something slightly technical into a video? So I'll take a brief look at what actually happens in curve fitting, as I do seem to be talking about it a lot. For this example, we take something extremely trivial. If there exists a downward acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared, we know that the square of the time taken for an object to hit the ground when dropped from a given height is two times the height divided by this acceleration. So this is given by the expression shown on screen. Our hypothesis states that g is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared, and we can test this by dropping stuff from different heights and then plotting it with height on the x-axis and time on the y-axis. Then without assuming the answer, we can pick an arbitrary value for g. And let's start with 5, and we draw a line where we substitute g for the value of 5 meters per second squared. Now this is a pretty awful fit, but we need to quantify how awful it is exactly. So we compute the difference between the measured values and a fitted function evaluated at our values for the IV. Now these differences are called residuals and we denote them with the lowercase r in here. The important number is the sum of these residuals squared, or capital R squared, and this number tells us how bad the fit is. Now in isolation it doesn't really tell us anything as we need something to compare it to. So we choose a different value for g, and this time we take 15, and we can compute these values again. Now we see that this value is smaller, but the fit is still pretty bad. We also notice that the fitted line is now below the measured value, so it is pretty likely that our correct value sits somewhere between these two. So we repeat this test for a range of values for g, let's say between 5 and 15 at integer intervals. We now plot the value of r squared for each value for g against g. We see that the value for r squared is lowest between the values for g between 9 and 11. So we repeat this over this range, but at finer steps of 0.1. We once again get an indication of where the values are the smaller, so we repeat it over this range again with finer field steps, and we can repeat this ad nauseum until we see no improvement any further. 
Finally, we get a value back, which in this case is G is equal to 9.9 .9 plus or minus 0.1 meters per second squared. Now, the bit that is after the minus sign is the uncertainty associated with the measurement. I won't go into how this is calculated as that is a bit too tedious. We then compare our measured results with the expected results described in our hypothesis. In simple terms, if the expected result falls within the range defined by the measured result and its uncertainty, then you have shown that the measurements are consistent with your hypothesis. Or, more formally, you have failed to prove your hypothesis wrong. And this is important. But the whole process does have a bit more nuance to it than what I've shown here. But these are the basics. Whether you are trying to figure out how a medium's density changes the total force on an object, or whether you are trying to figure out if the data show that the Higgs boson exists, this is actually the basic process that you follow.